today, um, which was um, a collaboration between World Fish and the Potato Center um, with their research program on roots, tubers, and bananas. Um, and we've enjoyed having Molly here so much that we've contracted her here for another six months. So you'll continue to see Molly around. So without further ado. Thank you, Kendra, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, as she said, um, I've joined in October and I've been working on this report for six months. So hopefully I can tell you quite a bit about it, but if you want more details, obviously this is a summary, so you'll just have to read the report. <laughs> so um, yeah. So as a basis for food production, agriculture obviously uh, contributes to nutrition and food security and is assumed to be a critical determinant of uh, micronutrient deficiency. But um, despite agricultural growth, um, malnutrition still persists. Um, and this is partly or well, partly to blame uh, for the central focus on staple food crops um, and the fact that micronutrient outcomes were not considered in the majority of past agricultural policies. So today, um, nutrition and health uh, outcomes are considered a priority area within post 2015, like the SDG development agenda. Um, this is approached through uh, both nutrition specific and nutrition sensitive approaches to agriculture. Uh, so nut nutrition sensitive agriculture is what we're, this topic is going to be focusing on as it's a food based approach to addressing uh, malnutrition and aims to address the underlying determinants of micronutrient deficiency, uh, specifically access to nutritious, safe and affordable food. So integrated agriculture aquaculture is a subset of uh, integrated agriculture um, and it's commonly referred to as I guess diversified production uh, and commonly equated with two component ag agricultural systems. So I think we've seen a lot around uh, rice fish or livestock fish systems. Um, so it's often characterized by the synergistic recycling and reuse of agricultural byproducts. Um, but according to Edwards, um, 1998, uh, a more holistic conceptualization moves and extends beyond this uh, two component system to include um, a much more complex multi component system, which includes sequential as well as concurrent uh, linkages between subsystems. Uh, and it in, as well as incorporating the reuse of on farm products, it also includes off farm resources and operates over a variety of scales. So from small scale subsistence to, um, to commercial uh, scale uh, activities. Um, so yeah, integrated agriculture, aquaculture can be seen as a food based approach to agriculture and also uh, is often referred to as multiple goal agriculture as it seemed to um, not just focus on increasing production, but also addressing um, the economic, ecological and livelihoods um, outcomes of agriculture. So yeah, as Kendra said, um, this report has been commissioned uh, by uh, World Fish under the Fish uh, CGR research program, but also the uh, Roots, Tubers and Bananas CGR research, research program, which is led by uh, SIP, the International Potato Center. Um, so yeah, I guess under this idea that uh, both fish obviously um, as is important to uh, nutrition as we know that fish especially small fish um, and other aquatic animals are an important source of essential fatty acids micronutrients um, and globally um, many bil or one billion people and many more uh, depend on fish as their main source of animal protein uh, and similarly with uh, roots, tubers and bananas, this is a staple crop in many low income countries and even ab above con more, more popularly consumed than rice in some. Um, yeah, and orange sweet potato, as I think most people will probably know, um, is used and in, like instrumentalized for its uh, vitamin A rich uh, content. Uh, and its ability to meet uh, the daily vitamin A requirements of uh, both young children and adults who are suffering from a lot of micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, similarly, uh, these crops are said to be resilient and therefore um, important when thinking about uh, adapting to climate change. 
Um, so yeah, this is primarily um, a, lit a literature review. Uh, it's narrative, uh, but it's also complemented by um, some semi-structured interviews and primary data collection that was conducted during a two-week field trip in Bangladesh. Um, so uh, it focuses primarily, it's a, a global review, but then kind of zooms in on two countries, uh, Bangladesh and Nigeria. So uh, the literature review, um, I guess the eligibility criteria was um, finding papers that contained evidence of at least a, a synergy between fish and at least one root tuber or banana. Um, and they were published after 2000 and produced in English. Uh, and then the primary data, as I said, was conducted during a two-week uh, field trip to Bangladesh, and a total of 22 semi-structured interviews were carried out with um, academic professionals or key informants, uh, fish feed manufacturers, fish feed dealers, fish filmers, and uh, farmers growing roots, tubers, and bananas, and households um, in four divisions of Bangladesh, which is Silet, Rangpur, Maiman Singh, and Dakar. Uh, yeah, and these were purposefully sampled based on, uh, I guess, the information that we deem wanted to collect. Uh, the primary data collection was deemed appropriate because there was actually a lack of information uh, specific to Bangladesh uh, on maybe some of these more synergistic um, interactions between roots, tubers, bananas, and fish. Often, roots, tubers, and bananas are like uh, used under the umbrella heading of crops, so we kind of, this primary data was uh, deemed appropriate to kind of delve into that a bit deeper and find out these uh, linkages. Uh, yeah, so in the literature review, I identified uh, 46 eligible documents. Um, uh, most of them were peer-reviewed journal articles, but then as you can see, there were some more uh, reports and book chapters and even an um, MSc thesis. Um, so this, we identified essentially three areas of integration. So this is uh, integration at the point of production, I guess, so um, concurrent production of both uh, fish and roots, tubers, and bananas. And then uh, if you conceptualize, uh, as I said at the start, this integrated agriculture, aquaculture to extend beyond concurrent, but also sequential and moving across scales, then we identified the other area, which is fish feed. So using uh, roots, tubers, and bananas, specifically byproducts in fish feed. Um, and then lastly is the uh, integration at the point of consumption. So uh, dishes where um, fish are consumed with roots, tubers, or bananas, or um, complementary food products that contain both fish, roots, tubers, and bananas. Uh, so out of all of these documents, uh, it, the literature was generally dominated by uh, the use of roots, tubers, and bananas as fish feed. I think is this kind of word cloud here displays um, a lot of like feeds was um, one of the most fifth, like 50 most frequent words that came up in these 56 reviewed documents and um, yeah also like aquaculture um, yeah and growth uh, so yeah it was much harder to find uh, literature on the integration at the point of consumption. And I think this is largely to do because of the um, umbrella heading or like homogenization, I guess, of crops under this title of crops and vegetables rather than being specific. So um, yeah, first section is the, I guess, concurrent production of roots, tubers, and bananas at fish. And fish. So this is uh, these were taken during uh, field work to Bangladesh, and here's some uh, cocoa yam growing on the sides of uh, pond dikes and also bananas. Um, yeah. So a large yeah. There's a, a quite a. It wasn't difficult to find uh, papers on integrated agriculture. Aquaculture. I think again, there's been a lot of even collaboration with Will Fish and other CG centers on. Uh, rice fish farming systems and livestock fish farming systems, uh, but it was much harder to find, um, yeah, there was a lot less literature on crop fish farming. And then again, moving beyond that into the specific roots, tubers, and bananas was very difficult um, because of this, yeah, collectivization of crops, I guess. Um, so, yeah, 
it's, it was kind of hard to see uh, the extent to which roots, tubers, and bananas are grown in this production system because of uh, a lack of specificity. specificity. <laughs> um, yeah, so a lot of the documents sit superficially listed, the roots, tubers, and bananas, but overall, um, banana plantain, bananas and plantain were the most recurrent like group of roots, tubers, and bananas that were grown in the integrated systems um, that were mentioned in the literature review. And this was, uh, bananas especially, this was visible during field work to Bangladesh. Um, the yeah, cases including cassava, sweet potatoes, and other roots, tubers, and bananas were also documented, but to a lesser extent. Uh, and a lot of these integrated systems seem to uh, occur in largely in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, so yeah, some examples I found um, in Bangladesh, uh, I think around, I have the statistic, I think it's uh, 10, 100,000 hectares of land uh, is occupied by um, potato, uh, I guess, come fish cultivation. Uh, so during the uh, wet season, fish are cultivated, and then in the dry season, potatoes. So I guess this highlights the fact that even though they're not produced at the same kind of time, that uh, they are, in fact, integrated. The other one was Javanese home gardens, uh, where bananas, uh, sweet potato, and cassava were grown and cultivated alongside fish and often other livestock. Uh, and apparently, yeah, 20% of the total area of West Java is occupied by these home gardens, uh, although they vary in size. Um, and then from my field trip to Bangladesh, I identified some, I guess, illustrative examples. Uh, so of these synergistic relationships between, um, this was more, more broadly, uh, so I, this was, um, interviewing Suchana project households specifically, where they were being encouraged to cultivate fish alongside sweet potato specific, orange sweet potato specifically, but also cocoa yams and bananas were also present in a lot of the home gardens. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people um, said that they recycled cow dung and kitchen waste as compost on their agricultural plots. Um, and yeah, but they also said that um, when, I, when I asked whether they would use the pond sediment uh, for fertilizers as some of the literature suggests, many said that um, this pond sediment was deemed inferior to cow dung for this purpose. Um, and yeah, also uh, kitchen waste was fed to cows, but not necessarily to fish. Um, and yeah, excess sweet potato leaves um, were also uh, fed to cows, not necessarily fish. Um, and the only incidents where people were saying that sometimes they use uh, banana leaves for um, fish production was in the case of grass carp, where it's often uh, somebody reported using it, I guess, 10 to 15 times a week, maybe, um, in combination with uh, grass cuttings. Uh, yeah, so then according to key informants, they said that farmers sometimes boil old potatoes. This is generally at the end of the, or t like at the end of that particular um, period uh, before the next uh, cultivation, the harvesting, sorry, of potatoes. Uh, so these were, I guess, left over from the previous harvest season. Um, and then, yeah, they fed them to cows, poultry, and fish. Um, and there was also people reported uh, fish uh, feed producers who operate on a small scale with relatively low uh, technology, mostly for their own production. Sometimes also included potatoes when the market price was low, um, which was generally at the start of the harvest season in February. So uh, yeah, as I said, because it, it in the literature it's quite hard to um, distinguish because people sort of superficially mentioned roots, tubers, and bananas as one of the crops that was grown. It was quite hard to distinguish uh, the benefits of roots, tubers, and bananas specifically with fish production. So this is a more uh, broader overview of or beneficial outcomes of integrated agriculture systems. So yeah, it's being claimed as beneficial for 
soil conservation, biodiversity, livelihoods, food security and nutrition. And I guess this is where the multiple goal agriculture comes from. Um, and also led to, there's evidence that it's led to increases in income, partly because of this reduced cost and volume of external inputs um, that's come about after this reuse and recycling of on-farm products. Um, similarly, uh, production diversity is said to steady cash income throughout the year, but also um, reduce the risk from market or environmental shocks, so like water quality or dro sudden drops in the prices for a, um, a particular agricultural product. Um, yeah, and then in the same sense, it's also um, improved sec food security by addressing like lean periods when food supply is low. Um, but also, I guess the big part, looking at uh, how production diversity is linked to dietary diversity and how, um, obviously, um, as diversity in diet is um, instrumental to like positive nutritional outcomes, uh, how that can improve the nutritional status in farming households. Um, and I guess this is both through uh, subsistence pathways as well as income generating pathways. Uh, so yeah, um, some of the challenges I guess I identified was um, this was during the field trip, so it's kind of illustrative as well, rather than from necessarily from uh, publications. So uh, it seemed that the characteristic, like while, whilst the literature says that this characteristic reuse and recycling of ag agricultural products is uh, common, and yeah, and like necessarily involved with integrated agriculture agriculture it's generally perceived as uh, or can be perceived as backwards and actually discouraged by agriculture extension services service providers um, and this was a due to like their production related inferiority to compound feeds and chemical fertilizers but also because people cited um, people using pond water for drinking um, and they were worried about the application of uh, cow dung specifically um, because this has been linked to like zoonotic diseases um, and yeah the implications of this uh, so yeah uh, <laughs> people talked about the kind of the p almost power relations between uh, fish feed dealers and um, providers and how uh, if even small scale fish uh, farmers were encouraged to buy commercial feed and that um, semi-automated or small scale like low technology uh, feed producers receive little financial and technological support and I think uh, in the if I'm not um, if I'm correct the uh, in some of the guidelines it stipulates that um, small scale feed producers or cannot uh, without license uh, sell their uh, feed so um, yeah so this is on to the second area uh, which is fish feed um, so looking at that as a focal area for integration um, so yeah I identified 27 studies uh, which were mostly production centric so looking at lab based feeding trials um, looking at growth performance per primarily of replacing conventional feed ingredients with like non-conventional roots tubers and bananas like parts and residues um, and yeah there seemed to be a general lack of literature that attempted to position this topic within the agri-food system context like only a few papers really listed uh, stated the scale of uh, you know cassava production for example and how how this integration would actually work outside of the lab environment um, yeah so then on the other hand uh, a large portion of these papers were actually conducted uh, in Nigeria um, and this is also uh, a table of the feeding trials. So a lot of them obviously uh, based on cassava and sweet potato and almost all was either looking at tilapia or catfish. So I guess there's, there's gaps in that information as well. Um, yeah, so in general, it seems that uh, roots, tubers and bananas or selected roots, tubers and bananas and their byproducts can be effectively uh, incorporated into uh, fish feed 
um, only one study out of the 16 lab-based feeding trials concluded that it was not favorable to replace maize in catfish fingerlings. Uh, yeah, and that, but it was only, replacement was only effective uh, in terms of growth performance up until a certain replacement level, which was between uh, 10 and 75% across all of the, the studies. So I guess, um, but in, like in general, uh, when you look at the economic implications, uh, which just a few papers actually looked at, um, like calculating, I guess, the cost benefit analysis, and they um, found that actually uh, increasing, uh, incorporating roots, tubers, and bananas residues in replacement of these conventional feeds um, can yield uh, higher net profits, um, I think, I have some statistics, which if any, if we have any questions, I can do later, but um, yeah. But there were concerns up until this higher inclusion uh, level around the anti-nutritional content of the selected byproducts and the implications this might have on like fish mortality um, and growth. Uh, yeah, so as I said, a lot of the um, papers identified were actually conducted in Nigeria, um, and this seemed to be as a, I guess, an outcome of the specific like agri-food system context in Nigeria. So currently, uh, fish supply actually um, is, I guess, deficient of demand for fish. So, um, and arguably fish feed, um, the underdevelopment of the fish feed production sector, and also the lack of appropriate like fish feed ingredients in Nigeria uh, is, I guess, deemed a determinant of this, uh, or, or is prohibiting the development of the aquaculture sector more broadly. So yeah, currently fish feed uh, accounts for like 61 to 80 percent of the total production costs um, and majority of the ingredients are imported and yeah and but even compound feed itself is imported because of the uh, domestic feed sector does not produce enough for uh, demand but um, yeah so 75 percent of the fish feed requirement uh, is actually imported and that's compound feed um, so yeah, there's been a lot of research specifically on cassava, um, mainly because of the, I guess, the scale of cassava production and the associated production industry, uh, where, as you can see in this photo, uh, this is discarded cassava peels at the Gary processing factories. Um, and there's, uh, cassava is like, um, Nigeria, sorry, is one of the largest producers of cassava in the world. and about yeah, six million tons of cassava peel and leaves and pomace is discarded um, as a result of these uh, starch and gary processing sectors. But this information is actually quite out of date. It was produced in 2007. Um, so uh, I assume that uh, the scale of these waste products has actually increased over time, especially since there's been a lot of effort around increasing production uh, in general. So, um, yeah, currently the selected roots, tubers, and bananas, are, uh, cassava and sweet potato especially, are utilized by small-scale uh, farmers to feed sheep, goats, and poultry uh, in Nigeria, but no major livestock uh, feed mill uses cassava as a raw material currently, but I guess this is indicative of uh, potential opportunities uh, or a market for uh, these byproducts to be utilized in uh, fish feed. So yeah, uh, challenges is mainly scale and seasonality. So a lot of the roots, tubers, and bananas are uh, cultivated uh, by subsistence producers. Um, and actually, even the, in the cassava processing sectors, they only operate seasonally because of uh, the, yeah, I guess, inconsistent supply of uh, tubers. So. But yeah, as I said, up-to-date information is needed on the volume of cassava leaves and peel available within the country. Uh, and yeah, similarly, uh, logistic and spatial considerations. So again, the cassava processing sector at the moment is limited by poor road and storage. So it, it can be assumed that uh, yeah, the logistics around uh, 
moving cassava byproducts to fish feed manufacturers is also going to be uh, hindered by this poor road and storage infrastructure. Uh, and then the other aspect was, um, as a lot of the literature suggests, for uh, roots tubers and banana derivatives to be effectively incorporated, they need to be, because of the anti-nutritional factors and high fiber content, they need to be appropriately processed. Um, and obviously this would require or might require additional differential technical knowledge, skills, equipment, labor, and energy and time resources. And actually manufacturers may not consider the additional efforts uh, worth the savings gained. So yeah, then I kind of looked at whether there'd be similar opportunities in Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, in terms of cassava and sweet potato, it seemed that the, the production of these agricultural products is low. So on a commercial scale, there, there's definitely not the same opportunities as in Nigeria. But um, potatoes was one thing that was said to be the real only opportunity. Uh, because of the scale of production and already like wasted um, potatoes. But uh, in terms of the nutritional content, uh, I'm not sure it's necessarily needed. And also in Bangladesh, uh, they already incorporate uh, agricultural byproducts for energy sources. So rice bran and uh, yeah, broken rice is already like effectively included in fish feed. So there's no like the same need for energy sources in Nigeria as, it, as there is in Nigeria. But on the other hand, protein sources, uh, there's definitely a requirement to find cheap, locally available, and non-competitive protein sources. So still uh, a large majority of the feed ingredients are imported in Bangladesh, and this is primarily fish meal and mustard oil cake, which act as protein sources. Um, yeah, and obviously there's substantial human nutritional concerns about the use of local, locally sourced or caught um, and produced fish for fish meal, um, though data is lacking on this and, and de like details about the scale of the issue. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and but I'd say that from my understanding, there's definitely more contextually relevant plant-based protein sources that aren't roots, tubers, and bananas that could be explored and promoted further. So um, like sesame cake, ground cake, and duckweed, a lot of people talked about. Uh, so yeah, the third chapter, um, integration at the point of consumption. So uh, yeah, as we know, um, Fish, obviously, important source of micronutrients and essential fatty acids, especially small fish, um, roots, tubers, and bananas. Uh, again, especially vitamin A rich varieties uh, are, could be instrumentally used uh, to address micronutrient deficiencies. Um, so I identified 11 documents uh, detailing integration at the point of consumption. Um, and these were in traditional dishes. So um, fish, it seems, is a common accompaniment to uh, mainly cassava-based products in Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, and Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and this was in Nigeria. Gary, uh, which we've seen before in the previous slides, is uh, particularly popular. But the nutritional content of these uh, cassava-based products is um, deemed like insignificant because of the effects of heat treatment and processing has on the cassava. So there's been various uh, research that looks into improving the nutritional content of these uh, traditional dishes, like um, using yellow uh, vitamin A rich cassava um, instead of the, I guess, local varieties of cassava, and also using sweet potato in creating what's called a sparry. <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously fish, uh, in addition to these cassava-based products, is um, undeniably uh, increases the nutritional value of these traditional dishes. Um, but again, the, the species of the fish that's consumed with these two dishes is undocumented. So I guess the, the real like value added is undetermined. Um, yeah, and then similarly to... Uh, traditional snack foods that are generally um, 
carbohydrate based are also uh, the nutritional like micronutrient content specifically is uh, thought to be insignificant so researchers have attempted to improve the nutritional value of these snacks using fish or high quality cassava flour for example instead of um, cassava starch which is processed further and therefore like reducing the uh, micronutrient content um, and yeah, then similarly, complementary food products uh, for infants and young children uh, traditionally is rice based or cereal based um, and again has quite a low micronutrient content. So researchers have looked into um, improving the nutritional value of these traditional uh, complementary food products uh, with the addition of micronutrient rich small fish uh, and vitamin A rich sweet potato. And this was uh, in Bangladesh. Yeah. And um, yeah, the the um, I think the again, I have the statistics somewhere, but um, the content or the content of this complementary food product was meant to meet all of the um, or the recommended di dietary intake of infants for uh, vitamin A. Uh, the, yeah, and uh, but the nutritional value of the complementary food product was enhanced by the so-called meat factor, which includes the absorb uh, increases or enhances the absorption of non-heme iron. Uh, so yeah, the fish as an animal source protein is encouraged for use in these uh, complementary food products as well as like the traditional dishes and snack foods. Um, yeah, so the, the again, like I said, the species is uh, often goes unrecorded, uh, so the value added is undetermined. Uh, and similarly, the uh, whether or not these traditional uh, dishes or complementary food products that uh, researchers are developing, uh, often they don't actually include whether they've incorporated the uh, heads or the bones or removed the heads or the bones. Um, which obviously has an impact on the, the, the nu nutritional content of these products. Um, and again, there's a lack of uh, like follow-up information on these complementary food products. So uh, there's a lot of re research on developing these products, but then ha like what happens next is often uh, yeah unclear. So, um, and again, a lot of these uh, studies were often rationalized by a desire to like explore commercial market opportunities, especially with the traditional like snack um, products, uh, rather than actually like uh, rationalized by uh, improving like nutritional value of these products. So often the actual nutritional content of these uh, uh, snack foods were, was, was not detailed in the in the uh, papers at all. So yeah, um, I guess this is talking more broadly about um, challenges of, I guess, nutrition sensitive agricultural programs um, and interventions. So this is using, I guess, a case study from Bangladesh and in the Suchana project, um, the imp like program implementers have uh, faced some issues in terms of uh, like, acceptability or consumer acceptability of the um, biofortified like orange sweet potato that have, have been encouraged to uh, people have been encouraged to produce and consume in these uh, areas uh, the basically the local people often said that how they still preferred the um, local varieties of sweet potato which obviously is lower in vitamin a um, and the orange sweet potato was deemed as like sluggy uh, and having like a high water content uh, and also it had like unfavorable uh, like cultivation periods so it took like 90 days to cultivate the uh, orange sweet potato um, rather and like the producers actually wanted something that uh, grew in a much shorter period of time and I think that was so they wanted to grow more products within the before the raining season. So actually, I went to one household and they were hard, they had harvested the orange sweet potato early so that they could plant another crop before the raining season. Um, and I mean, I don't. There's no actual like written information about this, but I find it quite interesting. Like that the um, the FAO stat statistics, like uh, um, the sweet potato production in Backland in Bangladesh has actually uh, decreased quite substantially from the uh, well, from like 1970s to today. But again, 
I'm not sure exactly what this is maybe illustrative of, but it's interesting <laughs> um, considering, yeah, the other factors that people say, especially with the cultivation periods and maybe people being uh, wanting to produce different crops that are more suited to the environment. Uh, yeah, and arguably, I guess this this hype around, or what you could say, the like re a lot of research is going into sweet, encouraging the production and consumption of orange sweet potato, uh, and a lot of money and funding is uh, pushing this. But uh, arguably, like this is overshadowed, like the potential of other um, contextually appropriate crops, like Indian spinach. One paper talks about uh, this having a similar, um, like positive impact on uh, nutrition uh, for people in Bangladesh. Uh, and there's also a, a complete like, lack of information on uh, and data on domestic production of cocoa yam or the co um, consumption of cocoa yam, for example. Uh, so yeah, there's this hype has potentially overshadowed the potential of these other crops. Uh, so yeah. What's next? So uh, this is, a, I guess, a summary of all of those three points. Uh, so yeah, to encourage the households to diversify production, so fish, especially small fish, um, in perhaps like polyculture situations, but alongside like micronutrient rich vegetables, uh, like uh, roots, tubers, and bananas, perhaps. <laughs> um, and yeah perhaps training on uh, the reuse of agricultural byproducts for fish production or vice versa. So um, obviously, I guess people have deemed, you know, maybe using cow dung in ponds as uh, like problematic for uh, health. But I guess maybe exploring more about how, uh, yeah, agricultural byproducts could be used in fish production or vice versa uh, without these like negative impacts. Uh, yeah, and then in terms of fish feed, uh, yeah, more information is needed on fish meal uh, value chains in both Bangladesh and Nigeria. There was very little information on the scale of fish meal and like the sources of fish meal or fish for fish meal. Um, yeah, and then similarly, as I said before, the exploration of cheap, locally available, and non-competitive protein sources for aqua feed in Bangladesh is. Um, or could be considered a priority area for further research. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in Nigeria, in terms of the cassava peels, again, there's, um, the as I said, the information was quite outdated, so more information is needed uh, or up-to-date information needed on the uh, scale of cassava peels wasted and the value chains in Nigeria, and I guess whether this would work outside the lab environment, so considering some of these like logistic, spatial, and temporal um, yeah, considerations. And then in terms of the integrated uh, consumption, uh, so again, as I said, there's a lack of information on uh, more contextually relevant or potentially uh, micronutrient rich uh, vegetables like cocoa yam. So collecting more information on this and on the scale of production, but also uh, human consumption in Bangladesh. Um, and at the moment, I know I mentioned, uh, yeah, the the consumer preferences and the hindrances around orange sweet potato in Bangladesh. And I've been informed that um, Sip and Barry are developing uh, varieties with a higher dry matter and shorter cultivation period to try and address some of these issues they faced. But yeah, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>